All right, you guys. We are talking Idaho for Brian Koberger uh, in relation to the Idaho massacre. That uh, is the main case that we're covering right now. However, however, the the one thing we got to do is dig into another case first in order to get back and caught up to the Idaho four questions. So we're going to start uh, in a different way that I, than I've done before in the past. So, okay. It was a quiet November night in 2004 when tragedy struck the Porco family home in Del Mar, a suburb of Albany. Peter and Joan Porco, a respected couple in the community, were viciously attacked in their own bed. Peter succumbed to his injuries while Joan miraculously survived, albeit with life-altering wounds. The media was quick to descend upon the scene, but amidst the shock and horror, one name emerged as the prime suspect, Christopher Porco, the couple's youngest son. As investigators combed through the evidence, a chilling portrait of family secrets and betrayal began to emerge. Christopher Porco was a charismatic young man, but beneath the surface lay a web of deception and desperation. Financial troubles plagued him, and rumors swirled of strained relationships with his parents. But could these factors drive someone to commit such a heinous act? As the trial unfolded, a key piece of evidence emerged, the Christopher Porco Jeep. The very Jeep proven later to be bought by a fraudulent loan which Christopher Porco was at risk of losing. However, this evidence, along with some other circumstantial evidence, is what seemed to nail the coffin shut for Christopher Porco. Despite maintaining his innocence, Christopher Porco was convicted of second-degree murder and attempted murder. But even as justice was served, the case left behind a haunting legacy of unanswered questions and shattered lives. As we dig through... This chapter of the Porco Files, one case comes to the surface. Idaho 4 and Brian Koberger each had their supposed crimes, each had their supposed cars, each had no evidence. So how could this be? So what happened? I don't want to go into the what if when it comes to the Porco case, okay? Christopher Porco was convicted. There is a lot of true crime communities out there that question whether he's the one who did it or not. And I don't want to go down that route, right? The people have spoken and the people believed he did it. Um, I I have looked over all the evidence. I'm I'm more so focused on the vehicle, though, than anything. All right. Okay. And uh, so essentially he... Christopher Porco was going to school to keep it as vague as possible so we can get back to the important questions here. Christopher Porco was going to uh, college, and he was 21 at the time. His college was three hours away from his parents' house. Um, He had, like I said, a a really strained relationship with his parents where um, he had been kicked out of college. His parents bought him out of every problem he's ever had in his life. Like we've seen so many times before. Super codependent. Super codependent parents. All right. He ended up getting kicked out of school and his parents were freaking out because his grades were bad. He said, Oh no, that's not true. My grades weren't bad. Um, They're wrong. Okay. And, and the very next semester after that, he, forges his father's signature on a huge loan to pay for the next semester of school um, and says to his parents, see, look, I'm getting a free semester at school because they lost my final exam from last term. I did pass all my classes and now they realize they messed up. So they're paying for my school this semester. Dude, a college would never do that. Ever, even if they did lose your final exam, they would never do that. They just adjust the grade in the system. Yep. 
They That's would it. not pay your way through school just because they lost an exam. Right. Yeah. So he he forges his dad's signature there, okay? Then he gets a, a car loan and forges his dad's signature on that. And that is not enough. There, uh, there were burglaries at his parents' house that he's believed to be the suspect. Jeez. Somebody that knew the house knew where things were, uh, cut uh, the screen, got in the house um, and like it was targeted where what they knew that they, they were going after, stole two computers. These two computers were later found, but had switched hands so many times that they didn't, you know, they, it couldn't lead to any actual evidence that could be used. Now, um, Peter had a an ebay account with christopher christopher was doing these uh fraud fraud schemes on ebay where he was selling things and not sending them and then he created this story to all these people that he was his brother and sorry i can't send that to you because my brother died what really extravagant wild plans of financial fraudulence and like the amount of confidence that needs someone needs to be able to do something like that is insane like that's that's at a sociopathic psych psychopathic level and that's what a lot of experts have watched christopher have read through the evidence and and fully believe that he is a sociopath or a psychopath. Yeah, and and I feel like that's the kind of evidence I look for when you see someone who's accused of committing a crime, you're looking for this this clear background and history of being kind of a terrible person you know even if it's hidden and secret mm -hmm. um and they're nice is. nice on the outside like gacy yep. you know he to everyone around him he was amazing and then privately he was literally one of the worst humans who have ever lived yep um but there's a clear line there. Like you, you see things I, there. And, I agree. And anytime you don't see that, and it's almost like this person just lived a pretty great life. Maybe they had a few things in the past, like being an addict, you know, um, you know, which doesn't define people. So like, you know, there are millions of people who have moved on or being socially awkward. Yeah. Yeah, you know, or sure. getting bullied once like that's not enough for me because so many people have those issues and all of those issues like so many people have been bullied. I've never met someone. So many that people have been, been addicts bullied. and been bullied or been a bully. It's one or the other. And yeah. normally a bully has been bullied. They're right. being bullied somewhere else. You yeah, know? it may not be at school, maybe at home. Um, So like those things, like so many people carry that. Yep. in their past like so many and they're not killers like the majority of the population yep has been bullied and then addict that's a huge one too so many people have been addicts and bullied it that is, it's just not enough it's the differences with addiction it's self detrimental this is not this right. is not a selfless crime this is taking advantage of people in a way where it's a level of confidence that you know you are you know, the aggressor in this situation and you have the confidence to fulfill, you know, this fraudulence and he did it and he did it without remorse, did it without thinking twice. And um, so what it now comes the, the night of the crime. OK, and what Christopher says he did, which changed later, but we'll just stick with this story. All right. The first statement he made was he was asleep in one of the study halls at his school. All right. Well. One of the fraudulent loans he got, okay, was for a bright yellow Jeep Wrangler. Okay. So that car can't stand out anymore, all right? And I right. did a little background statistics, too, because what I'm highlighting here is the car evidence versus the Idaho 4 car evidence, all right? Now, what's interesting is, like, how likely is it that somebody else is driving 
a yellow special edition uh, Jeep Wrangler. And I looked that up. And when I'm looking at the national statistics on, on yellow Jeep Wranglers, it's such a little percentage that it, it, it says that it's less than 10% of people own Jeeps. And then within that, 5% of those people uh, own, and it's like, it's five colors. It was um, red, sand, green, yellow, and another one own that many of those vehicles. So a very little amount, all right? When you look in comparison to the Idaho 4 case, where a white sedan is the most common vehicle in the entire U.S., literally the most common vehicle in the entire U S but anyways, back to the story. So he, he says he was asleep all night. Well, the police had get evidence here of his Jeep leaving the, uh, that the night of the crime or before the crime, they don't know if it's like midnight, whatever. So his car's leaving at 10 30 PM, the college it's seen driving away from the college. All right. Now, at 8.30 a.m., it's seen driving back. So what is that? So 10.30, 11, 12. So 10 hours, okay? So 10 hours go by with this vehicle gone. He wasn't sleeping, even though he claims and still claims he's innocent to this day. But um, what happened in between that time? Um so on November 15th, 2004, Peter Porco, a 52-year-old uh, appellate court clerk, was brutally attacked with an axe while he slept in his home in Del Mar, a suburb of Albany, New York. His wife, Joan Porco, was also attacked but survived with severe injuries, including the loss of an eye. The investigation into the attack revealed that Peter and Joan Porco's younger son was the prime suspect. So, a lot of people have stated and used this case as an example to say, well, there was no DNA evidence in Christopher's car. But you know what's interesting? And, and this is the big difference here. And I think this is a very big difference. From Christopher's school to his parents' house is three hours. That Jeep was gone 10 hours. So if you take three hours there and three hours back, that's six hours. There's a remaining four hours to play with. That means that Christopher would have had time to clean himself. Mm, that's a great point. Um, because... I feel like in the Idaho 4 case, that's a reason I've seen a lot of people speculate that maybe Brian Koberger took a shower. Maybe he was there longer than they exactly. think, or it was somebody else entirely, and they took a shower, and that's why there's not this trail going out of the home. Um, and I think that's plausible. I think in I order to not get anything in the car, you couldn't have just covered your seats and pet foot pedals and steering wheel with plastic. You would have to shower and change. Yes. And, and, and I mean, maybe cover it in plastic for good measure. So, but I mean, I, I just think you would literally have to clean yourself before. I agree. There, there is no other way. Now, Christopher Porco was working as a veterinary assistant after, and did the cleanups after surgery. So he was at least somewhat knowledgeable of what, cleaned up blood and got rid of it and sanitizing getting and sanitizing, everything yep. gone yep and sanitizing know. but what what's interesting again here is that does any of that matter when it comes to his car if you're clean after you conduct the crime you know what i mean yeah i don't think any of it matters And and I looked all over because this was in 2004. We have had a lot of advancements in 20 years, right? In 2024 now. Um, and I I don't I couldn't find anywhere that they swabbed the um, 
the showers or anything like that. However, that's where the veterinary cleanup could help, right? With a hard surface like a shower, you could flip that shower curtain up. You could wash, do what you got to do, make sure nothing got out, and then spray whatever spray you had from your veterinary solution to make sure that it was cleaned up and taken care of and and fixed. That allowing you to get back in your Jeep, yellow Jeep, what a dummy to drive that. Um get back in your Jeep and then drive back. I mean, even in a shower, you could straight up use bleach. Yes. And, can. and yeah. that's not out of the ordinary to have, right. you know, to clean a shower with bleach. Yeah. So it, it's not really great point. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. But also I, I feel like this isn't even comparable just based off the time frame. The, how I agree. The, my main issue is the time frame. It, it's, it's not even, I mean, it's just too quick. Uh, you can't have it both ways. You can't have him in and out of that house that fast and nothing in the car or the home and the t- time frame be so tight of him driving that loop to get back home. Like he literally had no time to stop. None. He had yep. zero time to clean up. Yeah. Yep. Zero. Well, uh, and it goes back to just the time at the house though. It, it it's it's like you're saying that you know most people let's let's just give it a ton of leeway here 20 minutes okay let's say this crime happened in 20 full minutes which that's not the main story but is 20 minutes enough time to take care of the do the crime okay and then clean yourself in a way where you leave absolutely no evidence anywhere in your car and in your home, because so many people have this idea that like, well, he had weeks to clean his car. Obviously, there's no evidence in there. Look, that is not how uh, evidence work. That is not how bodily fluids work. It doesn't matter if it's four years from now. If there was DNA in there, if there was BLOD in there, if there was anything related, right? And I think a lot of people miss this idea that You have a a sharp-edged weapon taking place or being used in the Idaho 4 case. It's not as simple as just B-L-O-D, okay? There is going to be hair that had been cut off and, like, pieces that come with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, And nothing, nothing was found. No hair, no anything. Well, not without to, getting too crucial. Not, here. not to mention that these crimes occurred with the victims in the Idaho Four case in bed. Yeah, and in a girl's bed, there's going to be hair. You have a dog living in this home. You have multiple females. I know when I sweep my floor or wash my sheets, there's balls of hair. There are hair balls. And skin cells. Like, if you are conducting a crime that's this violent, and we know that Kaylee fought, you know, supposedly she was sitting up. I don't know how true that is. Imagine hair getting, it would, like, get in the way and come out, too. You know what I I mean? I mean, especially if there's a struggle (laughs) in a bed with things being moved around. Green. Like there's so many skin cells and sheets and comforters. There's so much hair in in comforters and sheets. The like, amount of cross contamination is insane. And in with there being a struggle, house. like if you, if it's not perfectly lined up where you can stand over and there is no movement, even then I'm not 100 percent sure you would get away without a single thing on you. I agree. I don't. But think the I, struggle makes it that much more unlikely. You know. I'm going to use the example of this case here, where as uh, the defense tried arguing that uh, obviously Christopher Porco didn't have any ev- any bodily fluids or DNA or anything on him um, because uh, the axe or whatever w- like keeps it at a distance. And that's not the case because every time you would pull up, there would be spray that would come up with it. Yeah, that no, that's not how it works. Right, I I understand that. Yeah, I, I get that. But I think a lot of people also think about the Idaho Four crime and forget that, like every time one stab happened, there had to be a drawback. That drawback pulls everything that that 
initial stab before it just touched. It pulls back. It doesn't matter if you're going sideways. It doesn't matter if you're going this way. It doesn't matter if you're coming top to bottom. Like it is going to come back. Well, Blaker even said that based off of the, right. the splatter, which I'm saying it for like that for a reason. It's not that I don't know that it's spatter. Okay. It's just it's triggered. Funny how many people were like, people love to, to correct. Yeah, That's but okay. uh, listen, YouTube does not like certain language. Yeah. Okay. So I don't care about being like correct on the word. We care about you understanding the, the point and ideas. Yeah. The idea of it and it also being able to get out there for people to hear it. Because if you say a certain word or you show a certain thing, your video is gone. Yeah. Nobody's going to see it. Um. So he literally, Blaker literally talked about in his PCA that the splatter would have for sure been on him. Like it's probable, yes. which probable means that it, it Very has likely. to be, it's yep. super, super, super likely. They, they don't say, um, that it's likely or could have, they say it is probable, meaning that shows that it was coming up that way. Yeah. I I agree. I agree. And it had so, to have gotten on him, which in a situation where there's four people and you're doing that every time, there's absolutely zero way that whoever did this did not walk out with a single speck of anything on them. Yeah. And, and even getting like real granular with details here. OK, Let, let's just assume that someone in all black clothing and a black mask did this. I find it so so unlikely that the one spot that there is skin showing wouldn't have got that got splatter on them even that one area every time you lift that up like the a string of will come that direction you know what i mean i just have a hard time no matter how you lay it out feeling like there wouldn't have been cross contamination directly onto the suspect's body unless they were wearing some kind of goggles or something of that nature that is the only way i could see it not getting on them yeah goggles hmm because you know if if dylan's statement is correct um i and i'm not saying that because i have any negative feelings towards dylan uh, Eyewitness account statements are already very, very, very untrustworthy. And then you put somebody in one of the most stressful situations they've ever been in their entire life, life it's going to become even that much more unlikely uh, or, you know, the, untrustworthy because of the trauma that comes with the human mind and memory and things like that. Um, but if if her statement is correct, I just have a hard time with the idea that there wouldn't be evidence like on them in that short period of time of that person being in that house or persons and walking out and only being able to see eyebrows and no evidence. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like, don't I understand just that. Don't get it. The PCA says in that, like, it almost is like she doesn't almost like doesn't know what's going on, but at the same time she does. Cause she's frozen in shock apparently. Um, but that, that's my thing is like, why doesn't it talk about her seeing this person covered in fluid? Like I, I, if you see somebody and you see their eyebrows and their face like that, you would think you would see that they're covered in that and it wouldn't take you eight hours to call 911. Yeah, I agree. Because the I whole agree. thing with her not calling 911 is like, oh, they passed out and didn't know what was going on. If you see and hear things, and then you see somebody walking, and they are covered in something, you know something just happened. Yeah, and it, it can only be one way or the other. You cannot have it both ways. Right, not possible. So when we take a second here and take a step back from looking at either of these crimes, you have Christopher Porco, which had... 10 full hours. If you remove the travel time, four hours, four full hours to break into his parents' house, grab the family axe, 
do this horrible, heinous crime, make sure he was clean enough to get back in his vehicle, again, four hours, right, to target two people that were in their bed um, and clean himself and then take the three-hour drive home. Um, when we're compares, comparing the Brian Koberger case, we're given, you know, between 10 and 20 minutes, even less for some estimates. Um, and t- taking his car, driving 15 minutes away from his house, uh, going in there, doing the crime and leaving with no cleanup. Uh, I just don't see a great comparison here. I think that the breaking news story that we talked about is a better comparison than this. Yeah. I really do. But the ultimate goal here is to know what the Thought Riot community thinks, you know? Yeah, I think that um, with Brian Koberger only having literally, it's it's like 10 minutes. It's like 10 minutes rough estimate generally is what is alleged. That's how much time he had. Yeah. Um, and then he immediately leaves and takes an hour and 10 minute drive home and has no time to stop to and we know he was supposedly picked up on camera leaving that area picked up on camera arriving home so he literally arrived home in the amount of time it takes to make that drive that they're saying he took Mm -hmm. meaning he had zero extra time none right none yeah it makes no sense at all that is way different yeah uh so you're breaking news update that which case was that again that was David Schroitman. Um, for those of you that didn't watch that video, uh, David Schroitman, and we can get into that too here, but uh, he was 27 um, of Somerville. And just this year, January 30th of 2024, took a knife uh, and ended an associate, stabbed her, you know, 37 times um, and uh, got in his car and drove away. And he had a couple days to clean it. Police ended up getting a search warrant approaching him. As they were approaching him, he was cleaning his car, but he had covered the seats of his car with bags, plastic, right? Similar to what we see in the Idaho four theory that he took his shower curtain and covered his seats. But, um, there was evidence still found in his car and found in his home. So he went, so David Schroitman went from the crime scene into his plastic covered car into his home and took evidence with him to both places. And, you know, I've also heard it alleged that maybe, you know, Brian Koberger left the crime scene naked, okay, or in his underwear. And there's those rumors about, you know, Bethany seeing somebody naked. Uh, I've even heard people say, well, maybe he took the shower curtain, laid it on the ground, disrobed, put everything in the shower curtain, wrapped it up and put it in his car, like in a trash bag in his car. Well, the thing is about that is using your own shower curtain, it's going to have your DNA all over it. So if he took took that with him, that's leaving DNA in the crime scene. And yeah. we, that's not there. The only DNA that is there is a few skin cells on a button snap, not even a fingerprint from what we've seen. Um, <clears throat> so I just, you know, I guess maybe if he left the crime scene naked, I guess. I, I but still even don't then, think so because you would have then, to have like liquid proof clothing then because it, it would still get on you evidence would still get on you it would seep we're talking about four victims here four would still be on your face yeah it da- would still go, go through clothing david schroitman had one victim stabbed a comparable amount of times um and there was a nut with a with a knife, and there was enough evidence on him uh, for them to find it in his car, which had been plasticked, cleaned, and in his home. 
That's just a really tough sell here. And we say it on every single one of these videos, just because questioning the narrative isn't what people would like you to think is cool, you know, and we're just not looking for that. We're looking into the science and not paying attention to what's accepted or what's cool or, or anything of that nature. Um, but with the Idaho four case, I, I have no idea if he's guilty. I have no idea if he's innocent. I have no idea if he is a part of the crime, but in a different way, I have no idea if he's one of four people. I have no idea. But I do know that what we're currently told doesn't add up. You know, what's interesting to me is that you have like, I'm going to talk about a case tonight that is really tough. Okay. It's a really tough case. Um, it's one of those ones that just makes you hurt. It makes your soul hurt. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, it was preventable. It didn't have to happen this way. Um, but it did. And there was so many people who could have stopped it. There were so many people who could have stopped it. What's interesting to me is that all these people that come out here and are like, don't speculate. You're hurting the case. Um, that's bad. You know, don't question the cops. Don't question all of this are the same people who will come out here and question the cops and talk crap about the cops when they don't have a suspect. When the cops aren't doing their job because they can't find who did something or because some of their missteps led to somebody getting away and then committing another crime, they they will call that out and, and talk crap on the cops then. But if there's a suspect, they're quick to condemn that person and say, no more speculation. It is that person, no matter what you say. Mm. Yeah. I keep seeing that. And it's all mainstream media that does that. And I don't understand it. Your mainstream media will come out and call out the cops only when there's not a suspect or they can't solve a case or they let this person get away. So they did something else, but not when there's major flaws in an investigation and the person, it, their life is at stake. They're being accused of a crime and there's major holes. There's major issues. Yeah, I'm I'm telling you, it's not it's, it's not, really strange. It's not cool to be, you know, punk rock and go against the grain uh with when it comes to true crime. People expect you to just have the back of the police no matter what. But here's the thing though, um that's dangerous to just be good faith at all times. I think uh, this this country was founded on questioning authority, okay? And our laws and our judicial system was built with the intention of being objective so people can question that authority, you know? Um, so for somebody to come out and be like, oh, shame on you, you know, not supporting your police, waving that finger, whatever, um, that's... It, that's just wild. I, I think a lot of times in those situations, it might be because one of those people needs to feel the comfort of that situation being resolved. And, you know, but then there's the other side of the coin like us where I don't feel comfortable because I feel like there's major holes in this case, which means there could be a, a killer or killers still free or we might be ending another life. I, I Those things scare me, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that he's guilty. That is my hope. Me too. I want Brian Koberger to be guilty. I want the uh, case to come forward and the prosecution lay out such an airtight case and answer every single question that we have and every single concern. And I would love to sit here and be like, oh, yeah. Good job. That's amazing. Great work. I, I don't have any questions. That's a, that's awesome, you know? Yeah, I don't understand why people take such issue either with saying, I hope Koberger's it. That is the best case scenario because they have him incarcerated. The best case scenario is Brian Koberger being guilty. Yeah. It absolutely is for everybody. That gives justice to everyone. That means the killer's off the street and nobody else is going to get hurt by this person. Um, 
that means we're not dealing with like a framing of somebody Mm -hmm. that is innocent. Like that is the best case scenario. If Brian Koberger is in fact guilty, him being innocent is a nightmare for everybody involved. Terrifying idea for sure. Literally everybody, the families, other people who are unknowingly going to be a victim, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean the justice system, it's, it's a nightmare for literally everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So it is the best case scenario. And I hope that is what it turns out to be. I really do. I hope so too. I I really, really, really do. Um, But I would love to know what you guys think about this. Have you heard uh, about the Christopher Porco, Peter Porco case? Um, My most positive best thoughts are with the mother, Joan Porco, you know, Oh, so another interesting thing is, is she lived. Okay. And, and gosh, the story is so sad. So Peter hours later, um, got up out of like, he was in auto drive. The one, the father, the one who got axed was an autopilot and, and did the same thing that he did every day before he went to work and like made his lunch with these injuries and everything. Um, you know, did stuff in the bathroom, whatever, and then ended up passing. Um, the mom was in and out of consciousness. She ended up losing her eye. Uh, I, you know, if only he called the cops, I know, I know, I know. they could have both lived. Um, that's so sad. They do. They were axed like an ax, like a full sized ax. Um, so law enforcement gets there and they're asking Joan, right? Trying to get an understanding, like what happened? Can, can you answer questions? She couldn't talk. She was in and out of consciousness, but she was able to nod her head and, and more than one person saw this. And um, he said, did, the cop said, did you know your uh, assailant? And she shook her head. Yes. And he asked, uh, it, was it a family member? And he, she shook her head. Yes. And then he said, you know, was it this son? Because they have another son that was in the uh, military, like in the Navy or something. And she shook her head. No. And then he asked if it was Christopher um, and she shook her head. Yes. She ended up going into a coma. She lost an eye, all this stuff. But later when she came out, she couldn't remember anything after she had come out of the coma. And uh, she, to this day, fights for Christopher to be let out, but she doesn't remember anything. No way. Yes. Yes. Wild, right? So wild after surviving an ax attack. She believes he's innocent? I don't know. I know that everything leading up to the crime was very codependent and codependency is dangerous. You guys, um, codependency helps breed sociopaths, you know, not all, not all codependency is a very common, uh, illness, a very common issue we have in the U S there are different severities and levels of it, but it has been known that some, you know, serialists have codependent family. Um, but yeah, wild but anyways i'd love to know what you guys think about it uh did you know about these cases the david schroitman case um with the knife the car the plastic the uh christopher porco case with the jeep uh no dna or evidence in there whatsoever uh and then of course the idaho four case which we cover regularly here um and let me know what you think about them